Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Where, where, oh, you're going to say something. Yes. Oh, well. Yeah. So, yes, welcome to Meetup of Pest, which uh, hasn't taken place for quite some time. There was this weird uh, two-year bubble in between that I don't know what happened, but everyone just seemed to like staying at home. Uh, so welcome back in the real world. Um, just a little word about hiring here at Hillsana. So it <coughs> has my full endorsement because uh, I at least have the impression that they take uh, testing quite seriously. So if you aspire to become a really good tester, this is probably a good place to acquire, to, uh, to, um, to apply for a job as a test engineer. Uh, yes, so Meetup of Test. Um, so we're completely non-profit, doing something for the uh, community of testers. That's why we're here. Thanks a lot for Helsana for uh, sponsoring the venue and especially the uh, quite amazing buffet that's over there. There is some wine and some beer as well, so just feel free to get up and uh, help yourself. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking now because I'd like to pass on the word to Michael Bolton. Uh, Michael Bolton knows a thing or two about testing, uh, so we are curious now to listen to what he has to say about the topic of software testing. And uh, there we go, you can introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. I am Michael Bolton. No, I'm not the singer. No, I'm not the guy from Office Space. And I will handle the humor for the rest of the evening. Um, I think it was 2009. I uh, was listening to the CBC. CBC is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. It's Canadian public radio. And uh, especially more back then than it is at the moment, but um, it's one of the wonderful things about living in, in Canada that we have a public broadcaster who can introduce us to such things. There's a, a TV series, a show, or a radio series, rather, a show called Ideas, which has a very broad, open mandate. Uh, it's available on the uh, on the internet. It's uh, uh, downloadable. You can you can uh, uh, get episodes of Ideas um, from uh, from the web. And in particular, they ran a, a series by a, a producer named David Cayley, um, which introduced me to a whole mind-blowing set of stuff. And um, I, I want to uh, I, I take you on a, a little bit of that uh, trip, because it was crazy fun and really super interesting. Back in the days when you know, a, a Twitter wasn't a thing, and we could all still read a whole book. <laughs> all right. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah. Maybe a separation funnel? Maybe a separation funnel. That's a good guess. It's not right, but it's a good guess. What's that? A gas lamp. A gas lamp. Well, it certainly involves gases, but it's not a lamp. Of course, the lighting in here makes it really difficult to, to see some of the details on it. This is one of the most sophisticated and prestigious scientific instruments of its day. Round about 1660, uh, 1661, uh, the gas part is significant because it is the invention of uh, at least a couple of people, uh, uh, Robert Hooke and Robert Boyle especially, uh, who, you know, for those of you who knows, know about things like separation funnels or gas lamps, uh, uh, Boyle's Law, um, is uh, about the relationship between 
uh, the volume of a gas and its uh, pressure. Boyle and his colleagues had um, uh, learned something from uh, William Harvey. William Harvey was a, a, somebody who studied the body in the early to, to, to mid uh, 1600s in Britain. He discovered something amazing that people hadn't really quite sorted out, that the blood circulates, the blood goes all the way around the body, and um, as it does so, it gets blue. And then when it goes past the lungs, uh, it gets red again. And uh, then it stays red, and then it, it turns kind of blue. And people were curious about this, why this should be so. And Boyle and his colleagues reckoned that it had something to do with air. And so what you're looking at is a machine that they devised for doing experiments on the air because they were curious about the effects of the air. This is an air pump. And the story of this is uh, documented in one of the earlier books that was part of a, a kind of a, a evolution or revolution in the way we think about science, and the way we think about scientific knowledge, documented in a book called Leviathan and the Air Pump. And this uh, uh, book and an interview in particular with a fellow named Simon Schaffer um, is the first episode of the How to Think About Science series that I referred to earlier. The subtitle of the book is Hobbes, Boyle, and the Experimental Life. You see, these fellows who did experiments on the air, led by Robert Boyle, evolved this new way of thinking about how we know things in the world, and they called it experimental philosophy. Experimental philosophy. Uh, they were followers of, of William Harvey. They were also followers of uh, uh, Francis Bacon, who earlier on in that century had uh, made some proposals about what we need to understand things in the world and how they work. And if I remember correctly, that one of the things that, that uh, Bacon said in the, uh, the New Organon, that is to say, it, it, it translated into uh, uh, English, the, the new approach, the new way of, of organizing our thinking about science, was that um, what we needed to do in order to uh, uh, understand how things worked in the world is, he said, we needed to vex nature. We needed to make changes in the normal course of things so that we could understand things a little better. Now, the way it worked out with, with Hobbes and Boyle was they thought, okay, air. How do we understand the effects of air? Might be a really, really good idea. If we want to understand the effects of something as, as Scientists, they didn't call themselves scientists. They called themselves experimental philosophers. The word scientist didn't come around until uh, at least at the uh, 18th century. They said, if we want to understand the effects of the air, it might be a really good idea to get rid of it. And as soon as I heard this on this series, I remembered going back to my history at, at Quarterdeck, a, a software company um, uh, that I, I worked at in the, in the 1990s, I remembered that one of the things that our developers did more or less habitually, um, because they had to do uh, uh, compatibility testing, they had to uh, figure out the effects of, of, of certain bits of code on other bits of code, one of the things that they would do frequently is they would rename or delete files 
to make them invisible to other bits of code or files that, that needed access to them to see what effect that had. Now, uh, these days, of course, the idea of, of what happens when you remove something and see the effect that that has, uh, these days that's kind of commonplace. But back in the 1660s, it was, such, it was an original idea. And it turned uh, the perspective that people had from uh, on science from simple observation into manipulating the state of the world in various interesting kinds of ways, and this is one of them. In order to get rid of air, you needed this very sophisticated, of course to us it looks crazy simple, but uh, uh, to the uh, people of that era, this was a very impressive uh, uh, scientific instrument. Then, the next element of experimental philosophy was to gather people together in order to witness the experiment, in order to watch it happen. Because then you could say, well, we had a bunch of people in a room, we performed the experiment, they saw it, and therefore, they could provide a, a testimony, testimony, that uh, this is, in fact, a matter of fact that this actually happened. And then, uh, in a way that uh, 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 Shapin and Schaffer described in, in their book, Leviathan and the Air Pump, a style of writing that they called virtual witnessing. Uh, Shapin and Schaffer, I believe, called it that. I don't think uh, uh, Hobbes and Boyle did. But the idea was that you write a description of the experiment, a sort of set of uh, procedures, for reproducing the, the, uh, the experiment yourself, which included an invitation for you, dear reader, to perform that experiment uh, or to perform that, that same sequence of actions and watch the same thing happen. And then on top of that, produce plans to uh, reproduce the equipment. And so, there you go. That's from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the writings that they presented to the Royal Society. Here is a description and uh, well, uh, at least uh, an illustration of the various parts of the air pump. There's a crank there by which you, uh, uh, you turn that and you suck the air out of the air pump. And they did all these interesting experiments like they would put a lit candle inside the air pump and they pump the air out and the candle would go out. Ooh, candle and fire have some kind of relationship to each other. And then they put a live mouse in there, they pump the air out, and a few minutes later, uh, they would have an unconscious mouse, and a few minutes after that, they would have a dead mouse. So the air and, 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 and living things appeared to have some kind of relationship. And they would take uh, uh, pieces of marble that have been very finely uh, polished such that when you whack them together, stick them together in regular air, you can't get them apart. But they put them in the air pump and they pump the air up and they fall apart like that. They produce something on the order of uh, 30 or 40 uh, um, procedures uh, for reproducing this effect. And you could build an air pump yourself if you could afford the uh, machinery. And in fact, this is also not only the birth of the scientific method, this is also the birth of the scientific consultant who would show up and help you get the damn thing working because it was really hard to do. They didn't have great materials for it. Um, they didn't have plastic or rubber uh, for seals. They had to use leather uh, and oil um, in order to uh, uh, get something close to a, an airtight seal. And then along came Thomas Hobbes, who pointed out your seal isn't exactly airtight, you know. Uh, Hobbes is a really interesting figure. Hobbes wrote a book that had one of the most important, well, it, it, one of the most important roles in, um, really, in Western political philosophy, uh, a book called Leviathan, uh, which I've uh, uh, tried to read. It's quite heavy going. Um, but it's about the, uh, the role of uh, a government on a society and uh, uh, why it's very important for us to have a, a, a government that can um, 
uh, afford uh, uh, various kinds of uh, uh, social uh, protections and constructions and so on that can uh, uh, let people get stuff done. Almost to some degree why you need a king. Why you need somebody to, to make decisions and organize a community and so on. So Hobbes was a, a pretty impressive figure. He was, um, uh, he was a, um, a counselor, a, a sort of consultant himself to various kinds of uh, people. He was an educator, political philosopher. He was a mathematician, um, although apparently a fairly bad mathematician. Uh, he discovered uh, Euclid fairly late in his life, relatively speaking. Um, he lived to a quite impressive age, well, well into his 80s, maybe even in his 90s. Um, he, but so far as anybody could tell, he, um, uh, he was a little bit over-enthusiastic about Euclid. Um, in fact, he took it so far as to believe that, that science he thought, should not be based on experimental philosophy. I mean, if it was experimental, it couldn't be philosophy. Uh, uh, he believed that knowledge should be based on axioms and then theorems that you could derive from the axioms. That was the, the royal road to true knowledge for, for Hobbes. So Hobbes objected to, to uh, uh, Boyle and, and Hooke uh, constructing these machines, and he, he laid out his objections, and, and Hobbes and Boyle had, or uh, Hook and Boyle had to answer them um, in order to, to lend some legitimacy to what they were claiming was possible. You see, Boyle thought that if we had a way of performing these experiments and then accounting for them in the way that they described, that then uh, we could say that something was a matter of fact and Hobbes didn't buy it. So some of his objections included the idea that, well, hang on, your machinery doesn't actually work very well. I mean, it, 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 it leaks. Uh, it, 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 another aspect of it was Hobbes didn't believe in the vacuum. He didn't believe that uh, uh, air played the role it did. He didn't believe that you could um, get rid of it. Uh, uh, Boyle was claiming something about the spring of the air. And Hobbes' objection to that was, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The tools didn't work very well. How is that like testing these days? I would wonder. You know, these uh, uh, test tools that supposedly help us uh, uh, find all these problems. Uh, you know, testing tools these days, like they've been for, I don't know, certainly as long as I've been in the testing business. And don't actually work that great. I did a couple of um, uh, blog posts last fall on um, uh, two uh, uh, low-code, uh, vaguely AI-claimed uh, uh, testing tools that allow you to, to uh, uh, the tool learns what you do and you, you provide it with examples and it replays stuff and so on. This sort of stuff's been going on for a long time. And uh, those tools, they leak, at least from a testing perspective, they're, they're, they're leaky tools. They're, they're, they're like the uh, uh, air pump that doesn't quite provide you with a vacuum. So I guess I'm kind of like Hobbes, because I object to these things. Uh, the, these are not new problems, the problems that I, I uh, listed on the, the previous slide. Um, back in 2005, which is uh, 17 years ago, um, I was using a tool called uh, a SAN, Innovative Simple Automation Module for Internet Explorer. Just to draw attention to some salient points on it. You no, no longer need to use wait for document complete or wait for busy in your SAMI scripts. 
This is being touted these days as a wonderful thing about these test tools. They can get that wait state right, you know, the, the thing where the page isn't finished loading and all that sort of stuff. This is a claim made 17 years ago, and it still runs into really serious trouble today that, that, that a test tool does this. Oh, and here's another thing, a GUI tool that will help you write automation scripts. This is not new stuff. And it, 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 these, still, these uh, tools still have these same kinds of problems these days. All right. Second problem that Hobbes had, I was getting ahead of myself, the experiments that Boyle and uh, uh, Hook were touting, he said, were theory-laden. He, he says, among other things, they're, they're based on a, a, an idea about what air was like and that there was some kind of spring in it, that, that, that there was some kind of uh, uh, resiliency to it somehow. And Hobbes didn't buy that. And it's true. I mean, if you have a, a theory about how something works and you design an experiment built around that theory, there's a risk that your experiment is, is simply going to uh, uh, reinforce this idea, well, how do you know the experiment proves that the theory is right? Well, the experiment proves that the theory is right. Well, how do you know the experiment proves that the theory is right? Well, because the theory is right, so the experiment would have to do that. And Hobbes saw this as a kind of circular logic. If this test passes, everything's okay, right? Theory says yes. This is one of the more popular uh, uh, kinds of things I've seen. This is what I've learned from uh, uh, the internet and going to conferences and stuff. This is how you test a login function, right? You, you write a bunch of code that you get, tries to get you to get there, and then you load the URL, and then you verify uh, uh, that the user can log into the system. And if the user can log into the system, then everything's okay. That's the basis for a whole bunch of automated checks that are out there running in the world, or certainly it is the basis uh, for a whole bunch of people's presentations on such things. See, we can log in. See, we can write code that punches a bunch of keys, and then we log in, and everything's okay with the product. Right? Right? I uh, spent an hour, I got a, 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 a irritated with this. I spent an hour doing a brainstorm of uh, uh, things that could go wrong or things that I needed to know or things that I should consider as a tester testing login functionality. And uh, just my risk list alone goes from there down to there. The quality criteria that I consider are in there. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that uh, uh, includes stuff that I, I, I don't know enough about in order to, to do an informed uh, a test of this. I had some test ideas. That, to me, is a lot more in keeping with uh, uh, the sorts of things that I need to be able to do as a tester. I need to be able to model the product. I need to be able to model risk. Uh, if I want to say everything's okay, and even then, I can't really do that. I can't say that everything's okay. All I can ever say as a tester is, I haven't observed any problems so far. Next thing. I think we've seen uh, this too. It, 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 any of us who test uh, have, uh, have seen this. If something happens once, and then it happens again, and then it happens again, is it okay? We can't verify that everything's okay. We can only infer that everything's okay. We can only make an inference that if it worked last time, and it worked this time, it'll probably work the next time. But we can't prove that that's going to happen. Just because something is true 10 times in a row doesn't mean it's going to be true in the future. Just because we haven't seen a problem so far doesn't mean that we couldn't see a problem if we looked a little harder or if we performed the experiment again. And in particular, Hobbes' objection was, okay, so you, take a, you do this demonstration in some drawing room on Pall Mall somewhere in, in London, 
and you see something happen, how do you know that it's going to happen anywhere else in the world? How do you know that it's going to happen in the south of England or at the top of Ben Nevis? And how do you know it's going to happen the same way on the continent? He says, you don't. Until you've gone there and you've done the experiment there, you can't be sure that it's going to happen the same way. It works on iOS. <laughs> How do you know it's going to work on Android? You've got to, you've got to uh, uh, think your way through this and experiment your way through this in order to, to make your claim more secure that things are all right. That notion, that idea reminded me of a book that James and I had uh, stumbled upon a couple of years earlier called with the thrilling title, <laughs> Reliability and Validity in Qualitative Research. Yes, it's, it's right there next to the John Grisham books at the airport, you know, right there on the shelf. I don't know why it's not uh, selling my hotcakes in a title like that. Three kinds of reliability that qualitative researchers, uh, uh, or at least Kirk and Miller talk about in this book, uh, which are, are relevant to Hobbes' objection there. Uh, Synchronic reliability. That is to say, does it happen at the same? Does the same thing happen at the same time, uh, someplace else? It happens here on this machine. Does it happen there on this machine on the same day at the same time? Diachronic reliability. Happens here today. Does it happen here tomorrow? Did it happen here yesterday? And then quixotic reliability. When something happens consistently, is it happening consistently because uh, it, it's, uh, we've got a theory that says that it should happen consistently, or is our theory messed up? For instance, this is the example that Kirk and Miller give in their book, the broken thermometer issue. You put a broken thermometer into a little cup that has liquid in it, it'll give you a consistent result. Put it into another cup, give you the same result. It's a perfectly reliable result, but it's because the thermometer is broken. It's, it's not varying. So a, an unvarying result may be telling you something and it may not. It's a very similar thing. A broken clock tells the same time twice, or uh, tells the correct time twice a day. <laughs> And then uh, Kirk and Miller talk about this as qualitative researchers. They were, they were in the Andes, um, and uh, uh, they were getting a kind of party line information from people when they asked about the role of coca, you know, the stuff, the, the leaves that, that um, uh, people in the Andes chew in order to, uh, uh, among other things, deal with things like altitude sickness and, and depleting energy when you don't have enough uh, um, uh, air. <laughs> So they would ask people these questions, and what they would get is a very sort of um, normal answer. Just like if I ask you, uh, Hillary, how are you today? Fine. Fine, yes. We always say fine, or I'm good, or I'm okay, despite the fact, what's really wrong, Hillary? Do you have anything you want to complain about today? That would take until midnight. That would take until midnight. So, but he says fine. For social reasons. It, it's been socialized into doing that. I do it too. Everybody does it. Lots of people do it. But people do it most of the time. I like to say acceptable because it makes people chuckle. Uh, but uh, I do that as a matter of routine as well. Well, these researchers realized that they were getting that kind of answer. So they decided to ask weird questions of the locals. They asked questions like, when do you give coca to animals? And they would, no, you, you, you don't give coca to animals. And in asking a weird question, they would get people off their center and uh, uh, they would uh, get more interesting information than if they just asked a, a, a normal stock kind of question. That's got a lot of relevance for testing too, doesn't it? What happens when we ask an unusual question of a program? When we challenge the program, Uh, 
That's like a, a check that ran green yesterday. If we run the same check today, man, there's a good chance it'll run green again today. But maybe that's happening not because the product is okay, but because the check itself is broken. It's an interesting answer. I mean, we tend to pay attention when checks run red, don't we? When a check runs red, you go, ooh, blue, red, problem. But when checks run green, we kind of fall asleep. Why do we do that? I, I remember I was at a, a client of mine, a very big company, and they uh, asked me to help them uh, to uh, address a certain kind of problems they had. They had a, a huge suite. Well, to them it was huge. They had 1,100 checks that they would only run on the weekends because it took 24 hours to run. Them. And they were asking for my help. They wanted to um, know how could they get this down to two hours? They really wanted to figure out a way to get this down to two hours. So I said, well, have we looked at these things? And one of the first things we found was, um, because it was a telecom equipment that they were uh, testing, uh, a lot of the tests that they were performing involved uh, booting up a switch. And uh, they had uh, uh, 16, uh, at least, of these, uh, which started by booting the switch up and performing a few checks and then booting the switch up again. Well, it took 15 minutes to boot the switch. Which meant that just if they did nothing other than that, it was still going to take them four hours if they continued to do it this way. So I said, your, your goal of two hours is uh, unachievable using uh, this kind of strategy. Maybe you want to do these things in parallel, or uh, maybe you want to boot the switch a little, little less often, but if you're going to do these 16 uh, uh, reboots, it's going to take you that long. That was one kind of analysis they hadn't done. The other thing I said was, how helpful are these checks anyway? Now, the, the math works out kind of nicely. I'm, I'm rounding a little bit, but not too much. There were 1,100 of them. Now, it's weird because I can't see how they were of equivalent value, but I can brush that aside for a little bit. I said, um, so do any of them ever run red? And they said, oh yeah, yeah, we, 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 we find uh, problems with them. I said, okay, um, let's do some analysis of these. And I asked them to go out and find, come back with some information. They came back and they told me, well, all right, 25%, uh, 25 of those 100 that are running red, 1,000 are running green, 100 are running red. Of those 100 that are running red, 25 of them run red pretty consistently because of environment issues. The environment, you know, it is kind of unstable to some degree, and so we get a lot of uh, reds associated with that. I said, okay. Um, although, if they're unreliable, why run them at all? You know, until you sort it out what the environment issue, why bother? It's just going to put noise into your results. I took that off. And I said, of the 75 that run red on the last round, how many of them were actual problems? And they said, uh, they did some math, and they said, uh, 68 identified problems that we thought were worth investigating. Seven of them were false positives. I said, all right, that's interesting. Now, of the green checks, <laughs> let me see where I'm going. If 7% of your red checks are false positives, wouldn't that suggest all other things being equal? And there's no basis for, for uh, uh, making any firm conclusions about that. But wouldn't that cause you to suspect that 70 of your 1,000 Green checks are inappropriately running green. If, uh, if or ten percent, I guess uh, uh, the the checks that were actually finding problems, if they're running red inappropriately, how many green checks are running red inappropriately? 
<laughs> whereupon they sang what Jerry Weinberg used to call the programmer's national anthem. that once people have seen a demonstration of this effect in action, then they will agree that uh, uh, what the experiment demonstrates is that the theory is correct. I mean, here's the evidence. Here's the experiment. We perform the experiment again. It agrees with the theory. The theory is true. Hobbes disagreed with that. <laughs> um, he, uh, he didn't think that that was plausible at all. He, uh, uh, now, Simon Schaffer puts it beautifully in the CBC uh, uh, show, in, in the Ideas show, the How to Think About Science show. He said, uh, Hobbes didn't for a minute believe that anybody who was invested in an idea would immediately say, upon stuff that was inconsistent with that idea, would say, oh, oh, you've got an experiment that shows that this is right? Oh, well, pardon me. I've been wrong all the way along. Silly me. Now that I've got some evidence, I'll just uh, uh, agree, and uh, we can all uh, uh, say that this is a matter of fact, and everything's fine. Hobbes did not for a second believe that, because Hobbes believed, uh, rightly, I think, that people who are bought into an idea won't drop that idea just because they see something. They'll come up with all kinds of evidence or all kinds of theories in their head or all kinds of, uh, of beliefs that will cause them to dispute the experiment and not what they're seeing. If you're a tester, you've had this experience all the time. Have you ever reported a bug to a developer and the developer says, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Having run that test, you ran that test? And it found a bug. Oh, there must be a bug in my code. This doesn't happen. <laughs> Not automatically. You need to bring your A game to that uh, observation. All right. These are some of the reasons why I want to emphasize that, that really good science and really good testing have so much in common. Because eventually, in the long run, Boyle and Hook and their followers had to answer Hobbes' objections. And that caused a, a, a really a, a remarkable refinement of their claims uh, of how we come to a matter of fact. And in, in fact, some of those uh, arguments are still continuing uh, 360 years later. Uh, we're getting better at them. We got a whole lot better um, in the um, period from roughly 1962 uh, uh, to the present day, and especially through the, the 1990s, uh, when the science wars were raging. Um, and that, that, that dispute has, uh, to some degree, fizzled out and, and has uh, uh, come to an accommodation for reasons I'll explain in a little bit. But this is one of the reasons that I raise the distinction, which I think is really important, between checking and testing way back all those years ago. And checking and testing is... Uh, about to get its 14th or 13th birthday this year, I guess, um, as, uh, as something that I've been trying to uh, uh, promote across the testing and development communities. Uh, a, a check is the part of a test that can be done algorithmically, wherein we operate and observe the product algorithmically. We apply algorithmic decision rules to the outcome of that operation. And then we relay the results of those decision rules to humans who then interpret the results. Well, that bit before the interpretation, I, I, I don't think it's reasonable to call that a test. 
Because it, for it to be a test, it depends on two things. It depends on the intention to perform a test, which machinery doesn't have. And it depends on the human evaluation of whether we're seeing a problem or not. My argument is that much checking is framed in terms of uh, uh, a demonstration rather than an experiment. So let, let's run down some of the differences between the two. The purpose of a demonstration is to show what we do, to, to uh, 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 produce evidence that the product can work, that it can do something. Uh, in a fairly um, uh, a specific set of circumstances, in a specific set of conditions, given specific input, and observing specific output. The idea behind a chest is to challenge what we know. To submit the product to often a, a disruption in the normal course of things. To mess with it, to stress it out, to, to, uh, to challenge it. In order for a demonstration to go smoothly, because that's part of the intention of a demonstration, it often requires a lot of preparation, a lot of rehearsal. A test can be a one-off. A test can be, be uh, something that we do quite deliberately or it can be something that we do very spontaneously. A check or a demonstration, the whole idea behind a repetition is to show a desirable consistency. That, that, that essentially, as Jerry Weinberg said in 1961, to show that the machine can reliably do the same thing or, or do uh, uh, basically the same thing with different numbers. Reproducibility, which is uh, uh, an element, an important element of a, uh, a test that has uh, integrity. The, the, the idea that we can reproduce a test without necessarily repeating it, that, that we can reproduce it with variation, uh, with, with different data, uh, with a different sequence of operations perhaps. That helps to reveal interesting inconsistencies. That's what we're really looking for, it seems to me, as testers. Inconsistency between the product's behavior and something presumably desirable. When a demonstration is inconsistent, that's a pain in the ass. It's something we don't want to see. We want the demonstration to go smoothly. It's Irritating, but in a test, inconsistency is cool because it tells us something about what we anticipated or something about what we desired or something about what we predicted is inconsistent with the way the product is actually behaving. That's revealing. That's interesting and worthwhile. If you vary the factors in a demonstration, if you do anything different or weird or unusual, that stands a chance of running it off the rails, disrupting it, making it unsmooth, bumpy. Whereas with a test, varying the factors refines or improves the experiment, uh, helps us show uh, a variation and in inconsistency which we would prefer to know about than not. I don't want to go too far with this, but it seems to me that in a lot of circumstances, the whole idea behind a demonstration is to suppress risk, to suppress worry, to reassure. Quality reassurance, as it were. Whereas the idea behind an experiment is to identify, to reveal risk, to reveal inconsistencies between the product we've got, the product we think we have, the product we want, the product that other people think we have. With a demonstration, deep truths about the behavior of the product are, are kind of beside the point. We want a nice conclusion and a smooth conclusion. With a test, an experiment, deeper truths are the goal, or why we're doing it. We want to understand something about the product that we didn't understand before. So what is a test? 
Well, the developers and designers, the test might be a, a checkable example. That's what most, uh, uh, when we talk about unit tests, and most of the time that's what developers are, are talking about, an example of behavior uh, that uh, will produce a bit at the end of it, yes or no, true or false, green or red, happy or not happy. Or it might be a hurdle that we have to jump over. Or it might be a demonstration. To testers, well, sometimes if I ask a tester uh, 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 what the idea behind a test is, well, they say, well, it's uh, all about uh, validation and verification. We are verifying that the product works. But that's not logically possible. We cannot verify that the product works. We can verify that we did something and it appeared to work, that it appeared to meet some requirement to some degree. But software is invisible. We don't know anything about the internal state of the machine until we choose to observe it. And even then, our observations might not be reliable. We can look at a program and say, well, it produced the right result. But until we try to re uh, uh, manipulate that program to get it to do the next thing, we don't know. We literally do not know whether it has produced a result and it's ready for the next input or whether it's produced a result and has crashed without doing anything to let us know that it's crashed. All we see on the screen is output. So until we tap that key or move that mouse, until we try to perform the next activity, we can't be sure that the program is still... Now, of course, we could uh, be looking at it in Task Manager, and it's still happily circulating there. We, we see stuff, and oh, oh, but if we look in Task Manager, we might see that it's allocating more memory. It's allocating more memory. There's a memory leak going on, and yet that's not gonna be visible to us if we don't look in some other way other than at the output of the program. So we can never say until we have visited the future and then come back from it that the product worked. We can only say that it appeared to work. And that goes double for saying the product works. Because can work does not mean will work. In fact, can work does not even mean does work. It just means that we haven't seen any problems so far. Much of this takes me to Harry Collins' work. See, I found out about Harry Collins because in that very first episode of How to Think About Science, Simon Schaffer makes a, a throwaway remark about a, a science as being uh, a, a kind of ship in the bottle. Uh, a lot of people see testing that way, too. What do you see when you see a nice set of test results? Well, it's, it's kind of like looking on the mantelpiece and seeing that ship sitting there in the bottle. Wow, that's really cool. How did it get there? Uh, I, I don't know, but it sure is really cool. And nobody sees the failed attempts the spilled glue, the tangled sails, the snapped masks, uh, the broken bottles, the spilled paint, the sawdust, nobody sees any of that stuff. Uh, my experience is that managers don't often look at testing very hard. They see the outcome and they say, oh, that's how they go, uh, I know, it's there. <laughs> I'm not even sure how it got there, but I'm cool with that. That's all right. In this book, Why Democracies Need Science, Harry Collins, who um, uh, is one of, or, well, arguably the most important sociologist of science uh, around these days, um, Harry, um, Harry wrote one of the best ever descriptions of testing. Um, 
See, I got really enthusiastic about his stuff because of a book called Tacit and Explicit Knowledge, which Simon Schaffer introduced me to. Uh, I was, I did a real fanboy move. I called up uh, Simon Schaffer, I said, could I talk to you, could I meet you, could I interview you? Uh, I'm coming to, uh, I'm coming to England. I'd really love to visit you at Cambridge. And he, he said, well, uh, the date you're talking about, I won't be in Cambridge, actually. Uh, I'll be in uh, London uh, giving a talk at the Science Museum. And I said, how cool is that? My hotel is two blocks away from the Science Museum. So uh, we went out and we had a couple of pints and we chatted about this and that. One of the things he recommended was Harry Collins' book, Tacit and Explicit Knowledge. And I devoured that. And then I got into Harry's book, The Shape of Actions. Uh, uh, and I devoured that too. And I thought, I gotta get this guy in front of a, a testing crowd. And so I arranged for him to uh, give the keynote. I was honored to be asked to be the um, uh, conference chair for the uh, 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 Eurostar conference in 2013. Um, and uh, I invited Harry to, to give a talk. <laughs> when I invited him, <laughs> Uh, the reply I got was so sweet. Uh, I, I said, you know, dear Dr. Collins, very enthusiastic about your work, wondering if you would give a talk to a bunch of software testers. And he said, I'm so glad you're from somewhere, someone in software. I've been writing about uh, uh, an AI and software and stuff like that for, for 20 years, and, and the AI and people never call, and they never write. And it's, it's such a plaintive reply. Um, and. Uh, so I, I, I exchanged with him a little bit about our ideas about uh, uh, testing and, and, and how James and I had this thing about testing and checking. And I said, well, one of the things we're, we're gonna need from you is an abstract. If you're gonna do a keynote, uh, could you give us a keynote? Or the uh, abstract. So I had not included it in this slide set, but since I have your apparently as a blind attention, uh, I will provide it for you right now. Oh. Oh, it's in the slide set, it's just hidden slides. Um, they're the two slides that appeared before this one. So let's do that. But they were in. Harry made this point, you see. It's a matter of some bittersweetness that he made this point so beautifully and that James and I struggled for so long to try to make it. And he, on his first try, he's not a tester, he nails it. He says that computers and their software are two things. They're machinery. Uh, uh, and Babbage's uh, uh, first, the first computing machine, uh, arguably, uh, Napier's bones before that, but the first really sophisticated uh, computing machine was actually machinery. The cogs and wheels and, and, and made of brass and it had at teeth and, and uh, uh, gears and so on. So as such, as a piece of machinery, it had to be checked to make sure that all the teeth are, are there and that there's no missing teeth and all the wheels spin together nicely and nothing gets stuck. That's a computing machine. But then Harry pointed out that machines are also social prostheses. Uh, like the prosthesis that my brother used to wear, there's a, my brother has no arm from here down. When he was a kid, uh, they fitted him for a, a prosthesis which just looked like a little mitten, and then we got a little bit older, when he was in his, you know, eight, eight to, to ten years old or something, uh, they put something more sophisticated on him, it had a wire that ran around back over his shoulder and a strap like this, and it had a hook. And if he expanded his shoulders, the hook would open. And if he relaxed his shoulders, the hook would close. So he could do stuff like that and pick stuff up. But was it a hand? Uh, uh, not at all. It didn't replace the thing that it was intended to replace. It, it sort of compensated for it. But it, it, even to these, it, even these days, a wonderful podcast recently on a woman who got a. a, a um, Myo something, Ugh, forget the term for it, uh, but it's a myoelectric arm. It, uh, uh, it's connected to her uh, nerves and she can open and close it. She said one of the ambitions she had, you know, is it really like a hand? 
So it's slightly disgusting, but she wanted to pick her nose with it. <laughs> and, and of course, it's not like a hand in that sense. Uh, um, it, uh, it misses the mark. A replacement heart or a, a, a artificial pancreas. They don't do the things that a real heart or the real pancreas do. And, and so the person who is um, uh, uh, using these things has to change the way they live or the way the body works in order to, to make this stuff happen. So Harry, using this metaphor of, of computers as social processes, point, points out that Computers can't do what humans can do because they're not social agents. They don't have social competence. They're not brought up in society the way humans are. Now, they can do all kinds of amazing things that certain humans with certain superpowers could do, but they won't respond the way a human does when they're confronted with something unusual or something different. They don't apply social judgment. They don't apply social competence, they're not socially wise. They only respond in ways that we program them to respond. Or, in the case of machine learning, ways in which we allow them to respond in what I think is a potentially irresponsible way. That means that the society around the machinery has to adjust, has to adapt, and has to repair the difference. Uh, the, uh, the word repair is very important in Harry's work. Make up for the difference between what machines can do and what humans can do. We fix that up. Uh, a nice example of that is um, when converting from imperial measurements to uh, 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 the SI measurements. Metric. Metric. Uh, I am five feet seven inches tall. But Chris, you've got a, a, a calculator in front of you. Uh, I can tell you that a, a centimeter is 2.54 inches. So uh, at five feet seven inches, you know the foot is called inches, I presume. Uh, how tall am I? 1.7 meters. 1.7 meters? Is that what the calculator said when you entered uh, uh, 67 times 2.54? I may be the other way, but. Oh, what does the calculator say? 1.702. So you repaired the difference between what the calculator was doing, because you said 1.7. Knowing that, now, why did you leave off the 0.02? You left off some significant digits, didn't you? Nah. Not sure this is significant. Oh, I agree. Uh, um, I mean, in mathematics, we call them significant, uh, significant difference, uh, uh, digits when they're not really that significant at all sometimes. But what you did just there was you repaired the output from the calculator into something that was based on social competence. I'm 170 centimeters tall, give or take. Of course, that give or take comes from the fact that 172, my normal slumping posture, about 168 probably. And even if I stand, you know, nice and tall and do the yoga thing, you know, do the, do the mountain pose and all that, it's still going to go up and down with my breath. The machinery is sort of embarrassingly precise when it comes up with that, that conversion. What that means for Harry, and me too, is the difference between what machines and what humans can do in the testing domain. As testers, we apply that complex social judgment to decide whether people are going to be happy with the product, uh, to decide whether that red check means there's a problem in the product 
we're a problem in the check, we're a problem in the environment, or maybe all three of those things are okay, it's just the check isn't relevant anymore. So, in this book, Why Democracies Need Science, <laughs> Harry uh, raises this issue. Why is, why is science good anyway? What's good about science? When he was a younger fellow, one of the stories about science, why science was good? Because it won the war. Science won the war. I mean, science ended the war thanks to the, the atomic bomb. Uh, but of course, if the other side had got the atomic bomb first, then the other side would have won the war. Would that have made science good? Harry's conclusion was, Science is good because science is good. It's one of the few places in the world in which in order to be a scientist, in order to practice science, there's a certain set of things that you have to do that are just fundamentally aspirationally good. So, a series of aspirations that I think tie really nicely to testing. One of them is, we can't say something is so, something is true, reliably, without actually observing it. And so here's the quote from the book. If you want to know something about the world, who are you going to trust? Somebody who's actually observed that thing about the world or somebody who hasn't? Somebody who's done the experiment or somebody who hasn't done the experiment? I mean, that goes right back to uh, 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 the, um, uh, the motto of the Royal Society, of which Hobbes and, er, uh, Boyle and uh, Hooke were founders. Nullius in verba, which means on no man's word. Not by word alone do we decide these things, but by evidence and by science. We prefer to give more weight to the person who's observed, even though. We know that observation is imperfect, that we miss stuff, that uh, uh, as humans we're very, very fallible uh, as observers. We uh, uh, are vulnerable to uh, missteps and uh, illusions of various kinds, errors. And we're also uh, uh, sometimes prone to um, social pressures that would cause us to modulate what we're saying in various kinds of ways. But by and large, one of the formative or aspirational aspects of science is that we observe things about the world and try to convey them to other people. Another thing that we prefer to uh, uh, do is we prefer to give weight to uh, experiments that have been replicated reproduced over things that provide an inconsistent result. Now, this does run into a certain problem that Harry talks about in other aspects, or in other uh, books, the problem of experimenters' regress. How do you know that a test is done, done well? Because a capable tester, like Chris Gletler, performed the test. And how do you know that he's a capable experimenter, a capable tester? Because he performed the test well. Now, that's a very interesting uh, a problem, both in science and in testing, uh, because the decision as to whether the test was performed well is not, strictly speaking, a, a product of a, a, a rational evaluation. It's a social evaluation. We establish our reputation as testers through our social groups. And how do we know that we are to be trusted? Well, because our social group says so. And why does our so social group say, say so? Because we're trustworthy. 
So there is a kind of circular uh, logic that happens. Uh, uh, but when somebody is, uh, repeatedly shows that they can perform a test well and that they can get uh, um, uh, the anticipated result, and presumably the desired uh, result, you've got to be careful about that because of this phenomenon. The tendency towards confirmation. And this uh, comes, again, from Kirk and Miller, uh, the guys who ask people about feeding coca to animals. Most of the technology of confirmatory, non-qualitative research in both the social and natural sciences is aimed at preventing discovery. And confirmatory research goes smoothly. Everything comes out precisely as expected. Received theory is supported by one or more examples of its usefulness and requires no change. Hello, green checks. Hello, test cases, that if you do them over and over and over again, shows that everything's OK. Repetition and replication of that nature, it seems to me, is aimed at preventing surprises. We don't want, we don't want to be surprised by those things. Not that. Uh, 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 it's impossible for them to do that. It's just that if we do it, it's really unwelcome. But we've got to understand that confirmation, the absence of new information, is the absence of insight. Doing the same thing over and over again doesn't tell us very much. Variation is essential. And in science, and in, in regular life, and in testing, New discoveries become available to us thanks to some kind of misunderstanding, some kind of accident, uh, some kind of uh, problem. Some disagreement between our ideas about the product we thought we had and the product we actually have and the product we want. Somewhere in there, if we're seeing a uh, uh, something new, something interesting. It's because somewhere along the line, one of those things is in disagreement with at least one of the others. Now, this applies, it seems to me, equally to uh, 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 tests and, and checks on the one hand. But I think when we put too much trust into a uh, an automated check, uh, we run into particular problems along these bases. Let's run them down. Our, our, our test result suggests that there's a problem. Okay, well, if it turns out there is a problem, it turned out to be a false alarm, well, all right. That's kind of unfortunate. We probably uh, wasted a little time, but in the long run, no harm done. Problem. Oh, and it's true. The test processes uh, detected a problem, and indeed, it's a real problem. It's a real bug. Yay. Our test found a real bug. We see a no problem result, and it's true. There is no uh, uh, problem. It didn't, uh, the product didn't detect a problem, or the test didn't detect a problem, because the product is, in fact, all right. But then there's this. The test product is, in some sense, not doing what we hoped it would do, and it's failing to reveal a problem that's actually there. We're getting a false report of no problem. So I've got a good, you know, since I've been yammering for quite a while, uh, I want to uh, take a swallow of beer and ask the question, how could that cause us Harm somehow or other. Well, now you take a picture of it. The beer in my hand. <laughs> what are you referring to? This right here. I can't see what you refer to. That. Yes, that. Yeah. If uh, if we get a false report, if we get a, a green, and it turns out the green isn't true. How could that happen, first of all? 
How, how could a green result come to be when there's actually a problem in the product? What, how, how would we get to that? Assert true, true. Assert true, true, right. Okay, that's one. In other words, somebody's got a, a, a check that's supposed to return a green if everything's okay, and it doesn't actually do any testing at all. By the way, just because it's so much fun, I love showing people this example. Uh, I was talking to Hillary about it just the other day. Uh, let's look at this. Let's go to our dear friend, the JavaScript console. Speaking of a search here, true. All right. And uh, let's ask ourselves this. Uh, one plus two equals, equals, equals three. When I press the enter key, oh, you want it bigger? Let me give you bigger. There we go. I ask you to predict. Will this return true or false? Gee whiz, what a bunch of testers. True. 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 All right, good. Invalid. All right. Now, we'll just change things a little bit. Well, didactically, this needs to be false. What's that? So without even looking at it, that needs to return false. Why is that? Just out, out of didactic reasons. Oh, you're saying that I wouldn't ask <laughs> if it weren't going to return false? Yes. I should write a program <laughs> that actually does cause it to return false, or to return true falsely, just to mess with you. <laughs> He's right. Huh. Precision, probably. Yes. Let's just uh, show what the actual result in that calculation. I mean, it's obvious, right? Point 0.1 plus point 0.2, obviously. Point three. Is this the machine or the software? Not the division. Not division. No, that's addition. Is it the machine or the software? This is uh, Chrome. This is JavaScript in Chrome. It's a software. Sort of. It actually kind of is the machine. Uh, because it's uh, thanks to a standard which I told you I would look up and which I did not. Um, it, it, it's an IEEE standard for representation of floating point numbers. And essentially the problem is that we got some bits and we uh, those bits are digital, binary. And then in the world of Floating point numbers, we've got things that are a lot closer to being continuous. And it's a limitation of computers and, and of the, the IEEE spec, whose number escapes me at the moment, at 750 something, which is a standard for representation of floating point numbers. And there's all kinds of subtle little hidden bugs in uh, JavaScript as a consequence of that. I will show you one. Oh, no, I can't show you the example because I just disabled the program just before uh, this talk. Yeah. Um, so, how could this mislead us? That thing there on the lower right. The check could falsely reveal a problem when there's not really one there. Let's have a look. That was your example. Assert true equals true. 
a check that was real, a real check, it was there in the repository, but it never got run. That's a possibility. Um, a check was performed, but the results weren't connected to the protocol that we thought it was uh, uh, following or misrepresented the outcome. We just seen kind of the opposite of that, where a check is falsely reporting that there's a, uh, uh, a, a, a false non-equivalence. The decision as to whether there's something wrong or not in the product is a, uh, a could be itself controversial. And that's why this example, the, the, the pl uh, point one plus point two thing, if you ask a programmer if that's a problem, the programmer will say, well, no, not really. We just code around it. Right? We, we truncate that last digit and everything's going to be fine. And indeed, programmers learn to do that. So, uh, um, as a my my tester's mind wants to say that this is a terrible problem in the IEEE uh, spec or the standard, and it, the other part of me says, "Well, wait, this can't be a problem because this is just the way computers work." <laughs> uh, if they're going to be following that standard, so it's kind of a dilemma. A check can mislead us if there's evidence of a similar kind of check uh, that shows that our green check is wrong. Or maybe we've got a whole suite of checks and they're, they're kind of too shallow or they, they, they misrepresent the test space. Maybe we ran the check and then the product changed after that. Wouldn't be the first time that happened. Maybe the check defaults to green and the check actually hasn't finished running yet, such that if there were a red there, the red flag would go up. But here are two things that I think are really crucial for us to remember as testers, especially when we're dealing with a large suite of automated checks, a sufficiently large number of automated checks is incomprehensible. That is to say, as Microsoft used to say of Windows Vista proudly, there are 160,000 automated tests that we run on every bill. Well, okay, but how often were those checks reviewed? How often were those uh, checks even looked at the first time? How many of them were written by the old ones, the cherished ones, the wise ones? Uh, you know, the interns from last summer. Because a lot of the time, uh, this is a reversal from what used to happen uh, uh, 60 years or so ago. It used to be that the testers, the people responsible for testing the product, were the most senior, the most experienced. The hottest shot programmers. The ones who were the most uh, 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 experienced and skeptical. The ones who had been bitten, bitten most often. These days, a lot of the time when automated checks are being written, it's being written by a newbie. Uh, somebody who's a newbie to programming, relatively speaking, in a commercial context, and a newbie to testing. So we've got to worry about this. All right, just a few more uh, uh, slides and then the time to chat. This, I think, is the most formative aspect of both science and testing. What is science really all about? Ah, you talk to Karl Popper and his crowd. Popper would say that the big deal with science is not trying to corroborate the theory, not trying to confirm that the theory is right, but an effort to falsify the theory, an effort to show that the theory is not right. Translated into testing, that would be an effort to show that our assumptions about the goodness of the product are not true. Now, it could be that we create a whole bunch of really interesting tests designed to show that our assumptions about the product are not true, and none of them reveal the idea that the product is not true. None of them can, uh, allow us to conclude that the product is, is uh, a bad product. 
or that the product has problems. Well, I think that's stronger than a bunch of uh, checks or even a bunch of tests to show that the product is okay. In other words, our testing, I suggest, should be challenging the product, not confirming that everything's okay. Trying to invalidate our beliefs about the product rather than validating them. And Harry asks this question of science, and I would ask the same question of testing. Which do we prefer? A world in which we invite challenges to our products, to our beliefs, to our societies, to our politicians, to our, our, our beliefs about the world? Or should we prefer one where we say, no, we reject the idea of challenging this? I, mean, I think we can look at several societies around the world and feel a certain kind of level of discomfort about the way that those uh, uh, that the governments in, in those societies are not tolerating that kind of question. So maybe I can conclude on the, the slide that follows this one. When we say that uh, uh, we believe that we've got a good product, we can accumulate evidence to support that it's a good product, but I don't think that, as testers, I don't think that's really where the action is. I think what we need to be doing is attempting to collect evidence as to why we might believe that it's not a good product. And if we're unsuccessful in that attempt, then we can make a much stronger conclusion that it's a good product. That our tests should be challenging. Now, what we're trying to do about the product is we're trying to take our observations about it, our interactions with it, and turn those from assumptions into facts. Challenging the assumptions that it's a good project, a, a product, uh, uh, trying to assert, trying to follow the assumption that it's a bad product. And when we fail to collect evidence for the fact that it's a bad product, that strengthens our belief that it's a good product. The funny thing about it, it's not asymmetric, it's not symmetrical. The relation there is not one to one. No number of passing tests can show that a product is good. Not to my mind, anyway. One failing test can show that, uh, uh, suggest to us that a product is bad or that a product has a, a problem. We investigate that. But I don't care how many passing tests you run. I, I, I don't believe in pass or fail anyway. I don't test for pass. I test for the presence of a problem. That's what I'm testing. So testing is learning about a product through experiencing, exploring, and experimenting with it. What we're doing as testers, I would argue, is that we're trying to curate premises, gather premises, uh, 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 statements about the product that begin a chain of reasoning, checking assumptions that are safe, checking assumptions that if they turn out to be wrong, doesn't cause us a, a, a whole ton of harm. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't get us in trouble with our so, social group. Questioning assumptions that are more risky. Challenging those assumptions. Gathering evidence to show where our inferences about the product are weak. And challenging assumptions or hypotheses that other people have about the product that they assume to be facts. That they believe to be facts but that we treat as assumptions. And as testers, the thing that makes us different, some assumptions are reckless. Let's not make those. Let's avoid making those. And in fact, if we see a reckless assumption, maybe the appropriate way to respond to that is not to test at all, but to have a conversation with the client. 
Because testing does have a certain level of cost associated with it. And if an assumption about the product is reckless, maybe performing that test is not worthwhile. Maybe the, the assumption is so dangerous, has such a possibility of being wrong, or is so consequential, that we don't want to go there. Risky assumptions, those would be good things to test. Uh, assumptions that could cause trouble, but <coughs> maybe not cause so much trouble if they're uh, exposed uh, as uh, being problematic, or um, that uh, uh, can be managed if they're appropriate. Uh, there are also, by the way, required assumptions. We mean required in the sense of uh, required to preserve social peace and harmony. Uh, like, for example, uh, my assumption that that chair will hold me up when I sit down in it again. If I were nervous about that, or if I said, Hillary, uh, can you check this chair to be sure that it's okay? I don't dare. Yeah, you would be hoping I'm, I, I, I'm hoping he knows I'm joking, because otherwise he would think I was, you know, a nutter of some kind. Um, those are safe assumptions. <clears throat> or those are uh, required assumptions. But somewhere in between risky and required, there's this zone of safe assumptions where if a safe, a safe assumption turns out not to be true, then our social group, our, our, our peers in our society, um, our, uh, our development group will say, you know what, that was a reasonable assumption to make and so it turned out to be wrong, bad luck. Uh, I guess there's something here to be learned. Instead of uh, uh, the, assum the corresponding assumption that we were just stupid or that we uh, didn't test properly or something like that. Here's the difference between testers and other people. Every now and again, even though the assumption is safe, testers question assumptions that other people presume to be safe so that we can reveal surprising possibly damaging problems that everybody else went to sleep on. I think that might be enough for now. <laughs> so with that, I say thank you very much. Namaste. And, uh, <laughs> questions, right, thanks, Dr. comments, or chat? Uh, what I would propose is that we shift over to this beautiful uh, buffet. Um, have a drink and um, just have a chat in the, and mingle. Okay. Right. If anybody has questions, bring them. <laughs>